Okay, we're live. Good afternoon, CS19. How are you guys doing today? Woo! Oh, fantastic. That is what I like to hear. We have another wonderful class for you. We're going to be learning about independence. Oh my God, I feel like in the beginning of CS109, we just hit like great core topic after great core topic. Everything we've been talking about these first few weeks, they're so central to just probabilistic understanding of our world that will show you about how the world works, but also fundamental to building algorithms that can make decisions under uncertainty. What a good time to be studying probability. As I mentioned, we've talked about a whole bunch of important stuff. So as you get seated, I just wanted to review a little bit some of the important stuff we've talked about. Last class, we introduced this idea of conditional probability. Uh, and I know at this point in CS109, a lot of people will find it confusing to think about the difference of conditional probability and the probability of and. So in this world, A and B are two different events. And you can ask two different questions about them. You can ask, what's the probability that both those events happened? That's what we mean by and. And this is a totally different question. This is, what's the chance that A happens given that B has already occurred? Now, to be clear, if A happens, it is the case that both have happened. But the reason this question is different is we're not guessing if B has happened. We're being told B has, in fact, happened. You're entering the world where B takes place. Conditional probabilities are very exciting, but they're a little bit hard the very first time you learn about them. Now, that really does introduce three major questions we've thought about in CS109. We have probability of the and of two events, probability of the or of two events, um, or this conditional probability. I don't want anyone to get lost in notation. We borrow a lot from set notation, and as such, set notation has many ways of writing the exact same thing. If at any point you're like, what does a comma mean? Just raise your hand, please. Other people will be confused. A uh, comma means actually and. It is set notation shortcut for and, for and. Sometimes people don't even put the comma. They just put two events next to each other. And somehow you're supposed to mean know that this means and? Crazy set people. Uh, and similarly for or, there's a few different pieces of not notation. When we learned about conditional probability, we learned the definition of conditional probability, which says, here's how you calculate it. The probability of an event happening given another event has already occurred is the probability of both of them happening divided by the probability of the thing you're conditioning on. If you took that equation and rearranged it, you would get the chain rule, which says, hey, are you interested in calculating the probability that two events happen? Well, that's equal to the probability that one event happens multiplied by the probability that the other event happened, given that you just told me what event F has already occurred. That would have been so much to have done in two weeks, but we took it a little bit further. We also learned the law of total probability. And the law of total probability says, well, if I want to calculate the probability of an event happening, I can think about the case where some background event F occurs, and I can think about a different case where the background event F doesn't occur. And that gives me a formula for going from conditional probabilities to just probabilities without conditions. And then finally, we learn about Bayes' theorem. And if there's a single major key, something you 10 out of 10, 100% have to know in CS109, is Bayes' theorem. It is such a powerful, useful tool. A little bit unintuitive, but that's why it shows up in so many interesting algorithms. And Bayes' theorem allows you to go between calculating conditional probability in one direction to calculating in the other direction. So if you know E given F, but you don't know F given E, Bayes' theorem is your friend. That is how you're going to calculate it. Now, you guys should certainly write down all these rules, and you should have them in your back uh, envelope. You don't have to have memorized them for CS109. Our midterm, for example, is open book. What you really need to know how to do is how to use these in the real world and be able to solve problems that we give you in CS109 and recognize instances of these different rules. And I promise we would do a little bit of review by gambling. Let's do it. Do you guys want to play a game? It's actually a game called poker. <laughs> and one of the amazing things about poker is you imagine something that computers would be great at because computers can calculate perfect probabilities. But for the longest time, computers were not good at poker. You know why? Poker is a psychological game. You watch the other person, you'd be like, you're lying. Or like, you're definitely about to win. And you just showed it to me. There's this concept in poker that's very important called a tell. Have you ever seen somebody look at cards and you notice in their face that they just got a little excited? Some people, their face lights up. Some people do more subtle things. Like there's, there's people who have patterns where they'll always accidentally touch their money when they get excited. Tells aren't perfect information, 
but they're information that you need to use if you want to play this game of poker well. So I'm going to imagine you're playing against an opponent, and they may give a tell. They're much more likely to give a tell that when they have a winning hand. So if they look at their cards and there's a winning hand, there's a 50% chance that you'll see that excitement in their eyes. It might be the case that they have a winning hand and you don't see the excitement in their eyes. That's totally possible, but they're just more likely to show this tell if they've got a winning hand. If they don't have a winning hand, there's also a chance that you'll misread something as excitement. So there's a chance that you'll see the tell even if they just pulled two cards that are losing. If we want to make a good decision, if you guys want to win this game, you're going to have to reason about uncertainty through this complicated idea of a tell. Before I jump into the game, any questions about what a tell is? We've got a real game. I've got a program. We're going to play a game here. Real money is going to be on the line. Now, this game is based off a real poker game. I don't care if you know the rules of poker. I care that you guys know probability. And here's how the game is going to be played. Your opponent is going to have two cards. Now, this isn't the real game. This is just a demo. These are your cards. Don't show them to me. Do you have two? OK, fantastic. I'm going to, you know, during the course of the game, I'm going to see about, let's say, seven cards in this example. Is that right? One, two, three, four, five, six. Yeah, I see seven cards. And that gives me some information. My version of this game is very simple. If you have an ace, you win. I can change my belief about whether or not you have an ace based off the cards that I've seen. And I see your tell. You had a stone cold poker face. You gave no tell. That's what this means. There's not an excited tell. And then you guys get to choose to play. If you don't play, you walk away. No questions asked. If you do play, if you win, $10. If I win, $10 for me. There's an extra card. There's an extra card. OK, I'm not cheating, I promise. I'm just you know, trying to put all the winning cards on the ground. <laughs> We're not going to play with those cards because I could have rigged it. Instead, we're going to pay the run game. I'm going to run it. You guys ready? Same game. Your opponent has two unseen cards. Actually, what cards do you have, by the way? Nine spades and ten of hearts. You didn't win. So that would be an example of the opponent not winning. But that's not the game. That's not the game. We're going to play on the computer. <laughs> that was just a demo. That's just a demo. But they're really fun cards, right? OK. But this is a live game. And we have to calculate the probability. We have to make a good decision under uncertainty using all the tools that we've got. So same game. The opponent has two cards. I'm not going to show them to you. Instead, you have to decide if you want to bet whether or not one of those cards is an ace. One of those cards is an ace. We lose. Opponent wins. Bad times. You get some information. In this game, you see all of these cards. Notice how none of them are aces. Every card that's not an ace makes it more likely that there's an ace in your opponent's hand. But your opponent does not give you that excited tell. And just to recap, the probability of a tell, given that your opponent has an ace, is 50%. This excited tell is a lot less likely if your opponent doesn't have an ace. Importantly, notice how I use symbols. T is for tell. And A is for ace, which is the same as winning. Well, that means that your opponent won. OK. I'm going to have somebody play this game. But, well, actually, can I get a volunteer? OK, since you're in the front, come on up. You get to volunteer. But we're going to do this together. You're going to need a marker. We're going to try and figure out what we need to know in order to gamble. Now, you might just be a gambling type, and you're like, already know. You're like, I don't care. I don't care about the probability. I just want to play. But we want to optimize your chance of making a good decision. Does that sound good? Yep. So let's try and figure out what's the problem we're solving here. Oh, by the way, what's your name? Alan. This is a class. Class, this is everybody say hi. Hi. OK, first of all, let's say I have these two events. What will determine whether or not you want to play? The probability that they don't have an ace. Yeah, so if the probability that they don't have an ace, if that is greater than 0.5, should you play? Yes. OK, we know what to do then. 
You just need to tell me what's the probability that they don't have an ace. By the way, what's the, this is very related to the probability that they do have an ace. Right. It's just going to be 1 minus. Mm -hmm. OK, we need to know the probability that they have an ace. Now, this is an important thing. You have seen a tell. Okay. So it's a little bit more interesting notationally than this. It's you know, the probability that they don't have an ace given that you didn't see a tell, right? We observe no tell. So the probability they don't have an ace, given that you observe no tell, if that's greater than 0.5, we play. Right. Okay, should we do this together? Okay. okay. How do you want to approach this? I'll be your scribe. So we want to know the probability that they don't have an ace, given that they don't have a tell. Right. How do we approach this? What are our options? So if we use Bayes' theorem, right? Good. We want to get the opposite of this. So the probability that they don't have a tell given that they don't have an ace. OK. Since we know that. Well, give me a second. OK, you think about it a little bit while I write the rest of Bayes' theorem. <laughs> Sorry. I'm not as fast as writing as you are thinking. Okay, this is still on the denominator. I'm just, you know, boards, right? We're cool. Okay, in Bayes' theorem, you kind of condition off of one event, and then you condition off of the complement of that. And so here there's this other thing, which is just the probability that they do have an ace, and the probability of no tilt, given that they do have an ace. Do we have any of these numbers? It feels like no, but kind of it's yes. yes. Oh, we do. OK, fantastic. Which ones do we have? So I mean, uh, we have the probability that they don't have the tell given that they don't have the ace. What is that? That's 1 minus the probability that they have the tell given that they don't have an That's ace. That's so good. Did you guys hear what he said? He said the probability they don't have a tell given that they have an ace is just going to be 1 minus that. So probably if they, this one. We don't have this one. We have the probability of tell given ace, but you're saying the probability of no tell given ace is just going to be 1 minus. Fantastic. That is just a 0 0.5. OK. Um, do we have this? Yes, by the same logic. OK, and it is? 0 0.9. Oh, this is fantastic. This is going so well. 0 0.9, except for my handwriting. Still bad. And up here, this is 0 0.9. Is this problem underspecified? I never told you the probability of A. You're like, isn't that the thing we care about? What's the difference between probability of A and the, or let's say the probability of A complement and the probability of A complement given tell? Well, with the complement, you don't have any information about the tell. Exactly. No information about the tell. We just have to think, what's the chance that the opponent doesn't have an ace as it is? How can we do that? Is there like a Bayes theorem for that? Ah, yeah, great. I'll just pull out my deck of cards and start counting them. <laughs> or we could do equal likely outcome spaces. OK, so what are all the ways that your opponent could get two cards? Well, that's 52 choose two. Almost. There's seven I've already oh, shown 45 you. Choose two. There's 45 choose two. Does that make sense? There's seven that we're not including because we know it's not one of those seven. You can't choose one of those seven. Mm -hmm. And what are all the ways that they don't have an ace? How'd you get 41? Just magical numbers. You're just pulling. Do you know the answer to this already? Did you yeah. prep? <laughs> 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 Why 41? So that's just all the cards that aren't an ace in the deck. So there's 45 cards, and 41 of them are not aces. Right. So these are all the ways you can pull two cards, and these are all the ways you can pull two cards where none of them are aces. OK, we can calculate this number. We can plug it in for that. We're just missing this, which is going to be? Do you want to just do it? Should we just calculate this? I think we should just calculate this. OK. Uh, da, 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 da. Python, import math. Math.combination41, choose two. Divide by math.combination of 45, choose two. 83% chance. Hey, there's an 83% chance that that opponent is, is going to lose. Would you want to play this game? Well, now we need to evaluate with the tell. Yeah, 
ah, we have to bring the tell because they didn't have a tell. So maybe they actually do, uh, you know, maybe that gives us some information that we need to incorporate. Okay, so you can put 83% in here. Oh my God, should we just do this whole thing? 0.9. Okay, I'm going to call this a variable. I'm going to call this uh, A. That's this. Probability A complement. Okay, so 0 0.9 times PAC divided by 0 0.9 times PAC plus 0 0.9. Five, you're checking my math. You should check my math. PAC. So one minus PAC is just that. Okay. This is the probability, and now we have to interpret this. This is the probability that they will not have an ace, given that they don't show the tell. Okay, you got a ninety percent chance of winning or losing. You. Winning. Do you want to play? Sure. 10 bucks. You could just walk Stop. away. <laughs> you win! Everybody, round of applause. <laughs> okay, fantastic. <laughs> Buy your friends a job. Yes. <laughs> oh, you guys think I wouldn't pay up? I actually, yeah. <laughs> oh, my marker. Yeah, I don't keep the 10 bucks, but give me my marker. It's the beauty of probability. Like we don't have to just guess. We can think about this thing rationally. A lot of probability was invented by terribly addicted gamblers. We are not terribly addicted gamblers, but we can use the same mathematics that they invented to make more interesting decisions under uncertainty. Okay, 10 out of 10, most important thing in CS109 that we've learned so far is Bayes' theorem. You really, really want to feel solid about this. This was a hard Bayes' theorem one because you had to combine probabilities with equally likelihoods and Bayes' theorem, and you have to think about a lot of conceptual ideas. Okay. Do you guys feel good with Bayes' theorem? You're going to need a lot of practice, but do you at least appreciate that this is something that you will identify as worth practicing? Yes. Awesome. That's what I wanted. Okay. So that was just, you know, the review for today. A couple announcements before we jump into new content. Our sections in CS109, they start today. Some people have sections on Wednesday, most people have sections on Thursdays, and a few people have sections on Friday before class. Uh, go to your section. It's an incredible part of CS109. You will go through live problems. Now, there's two things to think about for a section. One, it's a great chance for you to get more practice. You know, I'm here in a lecture, and you don't get to work on the problems in the depth that you really need before you go into your problem sets. But the other part is, we're a community. And you're going to join a small group. And one of the things you do in section is give back to that community. Help each other out. We're all a team. If every single person in this room walks out knowing CS109, we will all feel successful. And you know, your grades are not based on what other people in this class do. So let's help each other out. Let's make a wonderful learning community where everybody can make it. And section, go there and learn. And go there and give back to others. Speaking about giving back to others, this is a super like not important thing. But there's this new learn with others button on the problem set app. So if you go over here, wow, 97 people. Learn with others. If you click it, you can get matched with somebody. It's not an obligatory part of CS109, but boy, would I appreciate it if you guys could stress test my server. <laughs> and also help each other learn. So if you guys are up for it, at 9 o'clock tonight, would you guys mind just like going there and hitting the button? You could spend five minutes just talking to another person in class, be like, hi, I'm Chris, woohoo, probability. Or if you did have a question about the, the problem set, you guys could talk about it too. Um, so let's try this PSAT party. If you're up for it, totally optional. The word of the day is kind cat. Uh, and you can write that uh, in the same way that we always do. OK. Are we done now that we've learned Bayes' theorem? Like, no, there is so much more to learn. And to really motivate this next great topic, I wanted to show you guys a, a cool program. We all know about DNA. So I'm going to give you a context of DNA that I think is quite interesting. You're going to be looking at uh, 100,000 examples of bats. And for these bats, you're going to get six pieces of information. The first five pieces of information are particular genes that the bat will have or not have. So every row here is a bat, and this is saying they don't have this gene, they don't have this gene, they don't have this gene, they do have this gene, they don't have this gene. And then finally, you have a trait, something that we care about. 
One of the things that people study in bats are whether or not they're able to carry Ebola. And maybe you're curious, which of these genes is telling the story of whether or not they can carry Ebola? Wouldn't it be so cool if we could just go from data like this to having an understanding of where that causality is coming from? Now, of course, we all know from data you can't get perfect causality, but maybe we could start to form a hypothesis about which genes are causing which other traits. Does that sound interesting? Okay, let's run this program. Do, 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 find structure. Okay, make this bigger, Python, find structure. So I wrote a little program, it's gonna look at all that data, and after looking at all that data, it asked me if I'd like to receive keystrokes for my applications. Uh, whatever. <laughs> I wrote this Python program and it outputs a hypothesis. And the hypothesis it gives me is that I think gene five causes gene two. And I think the presence of gene one and gene two is what's controlling whether or not this trait is expressed. How cool would it be if we could write programs like that? Now, I did a whole bunch of calculations to get there. And you see this word show up over and over again, independent. And that is the next great uh, topic that's in our crosshairs, the thing we're going to be learning about today. So stay tuned, learn about independence so you can do really cool things like write this program. Okay, well, we've gotten ahead of ourselves. We have to start at the beginning of our story. Uh, so let's start about the beginning of our story. We have goals for today. The goals for today is to learn about properties of events that make life easy. The main prop we're going to focus on is independence. And independence is going to make it easy to do probability of and. We're also going to be learning about mutual exclusivity, which is something we've seen before. We're going to revisit. And as you recall, that makes it easy to do probability of or. If you walk out today feeling comfortable with these two things, you've hit the learning goals. Let's start with the review of probability of or. We've already talked about the probability of or. If you have two events and you want to calculate the probability of either one or the other happening, there's one context that makes it very easy. The context that makes this very easy is if there's no outcome in both events, it's not possible for both events to occur at exactly the same time. You can just add the probability mass of one event with the probability mass of another. This is one of the axioms of probability. So it's one of the things that's given without proof. It's one of the foundational assumptions of probability. Uh, but it also makes a lot of sense. You know, if there's no outcome that's shared between them. Then you can imagine feeling how many outcomes are in E, getting that probability, and then adding the probability of outcomes in F, that feels like a very intuitive, reasonable thing to do if you want the probability of either of them happening. This property of mutual exclusivity, therefore, is something really interesting for you to look out for. If I give you two events, I'd like you guys to get to the point where you can look at those events and decide, are they mutually exclusive? Sometimes a problem will tell you, these two events are mutually exclusive. But a lot of times you might have just like look at the events and reason, is it possible for both of them to occur at the same time? If that answer is yes, they're not mutually exclusive. What about the case where they're not mutually exclusive? And while you guys think about that, there was a question. Just based on your uh, beginning definitions, can we see so something that is independent can also not be mutually exclusive? We'll get to independent in just a second. So let me, let me, that's such a good question. You're like wondering what's the difference between independence and mutual exclusivity. I will tell you that. But I'm just, let's get our heads around mutual exclusivity before we go into independence. Good question. Hold on to it. Here's what the opposite of mutual exclusivity looks like. So this is when it's possible for, their, for both events to occur at the same time. There are outcomes that are in both events. So both events can happen at the same time. What's probability of or like in that case? It's very similar to counting of or uh, when you have non-mutual exclusive sets. You take the probability of one event, add the probability of the other event, but it's like you've double counted all this probability mass that, of all the outcomes that count as both event E and event F. And so you gotta subtract off that double counting. Does that sound familiar from sets? Nod your head if that sounds pretty good. Okay, we're in a great situation now. If you want to do probability of or, think about mutual exclusivity. If it's mutual, exclu mutual exclusive, just add. And if it's not, you just use this slightly more complicated formula. Feels good. I'm gonna bump it up in a tiny, tiny little notch, uh, but then you're done with probability of or. You guys ready for more than two sets? What if you care about the probability of E or F or G? So like, you know, maybe E is that 
they have a tell, and F is that they have an ace, and then G is like they went to the bathroom or something like that. And you want to know the probability of either one of those things happening. How could you calculate this using the underlying concepts of E and F and G? Okay, we can start by thinking about the probability of E. I've got this neat little Venn diagram where I'm thinking about all the events in F, all the events in E, and all the events in G. I'm allowing for some events that are in both E and F, some events that are in both E and G, and some events that are in all three. I put a one in each of these subsections to say, if I've used the probability of E in my formula, each of these probability spaces has been counted exactly once, which is what we want. This would be the full answer if we had a one in every single one of these quadrants, but we don't because we haven't really thought about F or G. Should we add those in too? Let's add in the probability of F. If you add in the probability of F, things are pretty good, except we've double counted the things that are in both in E and F, and we've double counted the things, well, this is all the things that are in both E and F. Following along so far? So this is not the formula, because it doesn't count every outcome exactly once. We've double counted some things, and we haven't counted this at all. Well, let's count this by adding probability of G. And if you add in the probability of G, um, then we have, uh, this is counted once, but this is counted twice, uh, and do, 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 what am I? Hmm, I'm missing a step here. Okay, um, do, 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 do. Okay. well this is counted once, this is counted twice, this is counted twice, and actually this should be counted three times. When I subtract E and F, this goes down to a one, and this goes from a three to a two. So I, can su I subtracted off the space here, and it got me a little bit closer. You know what else I could do is I could subtract off one of these spaces. And if I subtract off one of these spaces, then all these numbers in this space go down by one. This is getting us closer. And then finally, I've got this final thing, which is counted too many times. And instead of doing the Riesel thing and just subtracting off this single quadrant, I'm going to continue on my crazy pattern of subtracting off every pair, and I'll subtract off every pair. So now I have a formula where I added every event on its own, I subtracted off every pair of events, and if you look at all the spaces and how many times they're counted, we're really, really, really close. We've counted everything once, but how come we counted this thing zero times? I thought we counted it three times. Well, we counted it one, two, three times, but then we subtracted it here, we subtracted it here, and we subtracted it here. It got added three times, subtracted three times. It's like we haven't even counted it once. So if you wanted three events, and you want the probability of or, if they weren't mutually exclusive, you'd have to use this whole honkin' formula. And the final thing is to add in the sets of three. Do you guys notice something cute? There's like all sets of one minus all pairs of sets plus the triplet of set. It's a little bit cute. There's some symmetry there. What a formula. Who here wants to use a formula that long? Nobody, like one person is like, yeah, a little bit. I like long formulas. <laughs> um, but you know, just the point here, mutual exclusivity becomes important if you have more than two events because this formula does get a little bit long. I hope you never have to go here, but just so you know how deep this rabbit hole goes, we should talk about n events. You know how here we like alternated between like singles and doubles and triples? Like we added all the singles, subtract all the doubles, then added the triples. You kind of take that pattern up to n. You add all the singles, you subtract all the doubles, you add all the triples, then if you go to four, you subtract all the quadruples. If you go to five, you add all the, all the sets of size five of the events. Insanity. Anyways, there's this more general inclusion and exclusion. I hope you never have to use it, but you should know that it exists if you ever feel like going there. And in fact, the biggest learning goal for you should be, I hope to do whatever I can mathematically to avoid doing the probability of or of more than three sets if they're not mutually exclusive. Because this just becomes a really, really, really crazy formula. Okay. This little cuteness here is just saying you're flipping negatives and additions. You can get into the formula if you ever want to, but as I said, the learning goal is do everything you can to avoid using this formula. Okay, so we have everything you need to do probability of or. If they're mutually exclusive, life is easy, just add. And if it's not mutually exclusive, you just use this in inclusion exclusion. Yes, question. I have a question. Like in the Venn diagram, why do we want all of these? One. Why don't we just want the outer peripheries of E, F, and G to be one? 
Uh, you know, this outer periphery means all the events that only happen in F. And you do need to count all the things that happen in both F and E. All these outcomes that are in F and E, they should be counted. And they're not counted here, because these are the ones that are in F but are not E. It's, uh, we should, let's talk about the Venn diagram afterwards, because um, the derivation is less important than the rule, but I'd like to make sure that people feel intuitive about the derivation. OK, good question. Ah, OK, so what do we do now? Is, it would be great if probability was only about or, but there's a lot of times when you need the probability of and. And so it's time to learn about probability of and. And you know how there's this probability mutual exclusion that made life easy for or? There's this property called independence, which is going to make life easy for and. If you can identify that two events are independent, or if you're told it, if you want probability of and, you just multiply. If you're told they're independent, probability of or doesn't get any easier. It's only probability of and that gets easier, and and just becomes multiplication. If two events are not independent, you have to revert back to the chain rule, which we've already talked about. OK, let's do probability of and. Let's learn about it. And independence is the key uh, feature that we're going to think about for two events when we're talking about probability of and. The definition of independence is going to be intuitive, but at the end of the day, it's mathematical. Just like mutual exclusive meant that there's no outcome in, in both elements, or in both uh, events, the pro independence is defined as the probability of A is exactly equal to the probability of A given B. There is semantics to that. Let's think about what that means. What's your chance of A happening given no information? That's the same as your chance of A happening given the information that B has occurred. That's a long way of saying B told you nothing. When I told you B happened, your chance of A occurring didn't go up or down. B had no influence on your belief. So it's like an independent belief. B occurring is independent of A occurring. So if the intuition makes sense for you, great. Otherwise, this is a mathematical definition you can use. If this equation does not hold, then they're dependent. Now, if we start with the chain rule, the chain rule says the probability of A and B equals probability of A times the probability of B given A. If we use this new definition of independence, which says that if probability of B is if B is independent of A, then this condition is the same as probability of B. This term becomes just probability of B, right? That's what we defined. And now we're left with this really important result about independence. If A and B are independent, that means these two terms are the same. And as such, the probability of and is the multiple of the probabilities on their own. That's why it matters so much, because it's going to make your computations much easier. If somebody tells you things are independent, it makes computations way, 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 way easier. You don't have to do any of this complicated conditional probability. If they're not independent, you do have to think about B given A. Independence is so powerful. In lots of advanced CS classes, you'll see people making independence assumptions where they don't belong. We will assume things that are not independent are independent just because it makes math so much more doable. But anyways, this is what independence means. There now are two ways of understanding independence. You could either understand that these two terms are the same, or you could understand independence as if A and B are independent, then probability of A times probability of B should be the probability of A and B. OK. Major key. I like these major T's. This is like from lecture, what's the most important thing to know? And one of the most important things to know is if you can find this property of independence in events, probability of and is going to become easy. This is a proof I include you don't need to memorize, but the proof tells you that if I tell you A is independent of B, then it also must mean that B is independent of A. That might just make sense to you guys, um, but you could prove it by using Bayes' theorem. So here's just Bayes' theorem for B given A. Because A is independent of B, this term just becomes probability of A, which is going to cancel with the denominator, and you're left with the probability of B given A equals probability of B. So if I assume that term, which is that A is independent of B, I can prove that B is independent of A. Just so you know. OK, let's try this using dice. So I'm going to think about two different dice, dice 1 and dice 2. Let E be the event that the first dice is a 1, and let F be the event that the other dice is a 1. Can we show that they're independent? Here's what that would look like. I would calculate the probability of E on its own. What's the probability that this dice is a 1? 
One six. What's the probability that this dice is a one? One six. What's the probability that E and F occur together? There's only one outcome where both E is true and F is true, and that's the outcome where one was one and the other one was one. There's 36 different outcomes of the two dice, and only one of them simultaneously satisfy E and F. It's certainly possible for E to be true and for F to be false, uh, but if both E and F are false, that means you know the value of the two dice, and there's just that one out of 36 outcomes. One six times one six is exactly 1 over 36. This isn't always the case. It's only the case if your two events are independent. And these two events are independent. Let's think about this conceptually. If I tell you this first dice is a 1, does it change your belief in the outcome of this dice? No, there's no complicated quantum entanglement between these dice. This dice gives you no information as to what outcome will come from this dice. So being told the outcome of one dice doesn't change your belief in the outcome of the other. That's the conceptual way of understanding but really, if somebody asks you to show independence, you should mathematically prove it, what we have on the board. Okay, let's try another one. I have a new event, G. And G is the event that the sum of the two dice is 5. Out of my 36 different outcomes, here are all the outcomes that satisfy G. A 1 and 4, a 2 and a 3, 3 and a 2, and a 4 and 1. The probability of G is going to be equal to 4 over 36. There is four outcomes that satisfy G out of your 36 possible outcomes. Now... If I want to show if E is independent of G, so recall that E is that the first dice is a 1. The probability that the first dice is a 1 is a 1 over 6. And the probability of E and G, well, that's an interesting one. Well, here's all the outcomes that satisfy G. Out of these outcomes, which ones also satisfy E? Are there any? There's this one. This one satisfies that the first dice is a 1 and the second dice is a 4. So it's both the case that the two dice add up to 5, and it's the case that the first dice is a 1. So there's 1 out of 36 outcomes where both E and G are true. I've calculated each of these on their own. If you multiply 1 6 times 4 over 36, it turns out you do not get 1 over 36. This is an example of dependent events. Now this is interesting. If they're dependent, Another way of saying the mathematical thing that we proved is that by telling you that the first dice is a 1, I change your belief that the two dice will add up to 5. That kind of makes sense. I told you the first dice was a 1. If I told you the first dice was a 6, does that change your belief that the two dice add up to 5? Yeah, because it's not going to add up to 5 if your first dice is a 6. So telling you that the first dice is 1 kind of means like, phew. I avoided the case of you rolling a 6 on the first dice. I've still got a chance of the two dice adding up to 5. When one event changes the belief in another event, that's dependence, and you would prove it using this sort of mathematical derivation. Yeah, questions? Would it be correct to say that whether G happens depends on whether G happens? Yeah, there, there's... I want to add a little bit to that. So you, the, the question was, is it correct to say that whether G happens depends on whether E happens? Yes, to be more general though, I'd say E happening changes my belief in whether or not G will happen. Because we're in this beautiful world of probability, things are generally not deterministic. Uh, and it's, when something happens, like you roll a 1, it doesn't tell you whether, what, what D, or whether or not the sum will be 5. It just changes your probability that the sum will be 5. So exactly. The adverse event happening changes your probability in the other event happening. Question in the back. Yeah, we're talking about um, epistemic probability basically a couple of days ago, right? I think a couple of lectures ago. Can you explain how Bayes' theorem kind of fits into that? Because we're using the word beliefs so often. Right? Yeah, I will always. I think of probabilities as representing beliefs. Uh, I always think about it as not just representing stochasticity in the world, but my own uncertainty. I feel like this example from the beginning of class really captures that. This probability of the other person having no aces, we can know that exactly. Because counting tells us exactly how to calculate it. But as soon as I got into this world of, I have to infer this complicated idea of a tell, I really do enter this world where I'm not exactly sure how the world works. And I use probabilities to represent my own uncertainty. And you know, Bayes' theorem, all these laws of probability allow us to combine those two things. These softer beliefs 
with some hard mathematical calculations and you can bring it together into probabilities. As such, you'll almost always hear me use belief as a synonym for probability. Such a good uh, philosophical question. Okay. I do want to give you guys a chance to talk to the person next to you. See if you can talk to the person next to you and define what independence is and see if you can come up with a clarifying question because this is an important part of lecture. Is there anything confusing about this? See if you can uh, suss it out. Talk to the person next to you. Okay, that was just a short chat. Any questions come up? I once had somebody ask me this really wild question. I love questions. Questions are you engaging with the unknown. It's like the most beautiful way of articulating learning. I just love, love, love a good question. And once when I was teaching 109, somebody asked me this question that I just thought was very, especially gorgeous. So I thought I would share it with you guys. A student raised their hand and said, you showed me what mutual exclusivity looks like. Those are those two events that don't overlap. Can you show me what independence looks like? And at first I was like, yeah, and I had to think about it. And I thought about it, I was like, oh, that's such a beautiful question. First of all, this is not what independence looks like. This is a visualization of a sample space. So you can imagine every outcome is just like some pixel in this square. And I have two events in the sample space, B and A. They don't overlap at all. That's what mutual exclusivity looks like. This is a picture of I'm saying it's not possible for both A and B to occur simultaneously, therefore they're mutually exclusive. Mutual exclusivity also means that the probability of A and B is equal to zero. And so if you thought about you know, uh, whether or not this is independence, if that left-hand side is zero, is it the case that probability of A times probability of B should be zero? No, we feel like these are both two non-zero numbers. If you multiply two non-zero numbers, you shouldn't get this probability of zero, which is the probability of both of them happening. This is mutual exclusivity. It's not what independence looks like, which begs the question, what does independence look like? This is what independence looks like. So I think this is a useful way of thinking about it. Let's use this independence definition too. Independence definition two says that probability of A is equal to the probability of A given that B happens. And if you think about that, the probability of A is like, how big is A relative to the sample space? And A given B, if you use the, the definition of conditional probability, it's like, how big is A and B relative to the size of the outcome B? It's saying that this ratio of A to the sample size is equal to the ratio of AB to B. It, it might be helpful or interesting to people. This is certainly not the 10 out of 10 important thing from today's lecture. But it's really claiming that if you talk about the chance of A happening, if you collapse to the world where B has happened, A is just as likely to occur. And so it takes up the same ratio. So this is a good picture of what independence looks like. There has to be some chance of both of them occurring. And it should be the case that if B occurs, then you have the exact same ratio of A to the possible outcomes as you did before you knew B occurred. This is not an example of independence. This is what dependence looks like because the ratio of A to the outcome space, it's smaller than the ratio of AB to B. So when you collapse into the world where B has happened, A becomes more likely. I think the most intuitive way of understanding independence is really just to think semantically through what this means. That's a mathematical truth. These are pictures which are also true, but I think that's really where you get the conceptual understanding of independence. If I tell you that one event happens, it doesn't change your belief that the other event happens. Okay, proof. One other great way to get intuition. You guys might be wondering about complements. We haven't been thinking that much about complements, but I want to leave you feeling reassured that if I tell you two events are independent, it is also the case that an event is independent of the complement of the other. So if I tell you A and B are independent, you can also know that A is independent of B complement. Who doesn't love a good proof? So 
by a lot of prob total probability, probability of A is equal to the addition of two different sets, A and B plus A and B complement. And this has been rearranged a little bit. You know, law of total probability, it says probability of A can come from two sources, probability of A and B plus the probability of A and B complement. And you kind of have the, that idea that B and B complement are background processes in which A occurs. And you thinking about this probability mass plus that probability mass gives you probability of A. If you took that equation, rearranged it, you get this first line. And nicely on this first line, we have A, B complement on the left-hand side. So I just rearranged this so that that's on the left-hand side of the equation. Now, I told you A and B were independent. So this term here is going to split, or on my slides, this term over here. And I can split it either to say, or I can split it to say that this is the same as probability of A times probability of B. Now I can factor out probability of A, and this becomes probability of A times 1 minus probability of B, and 1 minus probability is just probability of B complement. I want you guys to see what proofs in probability look like. The main learning goal of CS19 is more that you can apply probability in the real world and to algorithms that make decisions under uncertainty, not so much that you guys have to regurgitate proofs, but proofs are one way to gain that intuition. You can really believe me when I tell you, if I tell you A and B are independent, you know A is independent of B complement. And of course it goes the other way around too. Man, are we close to adding to the final layer of your fundamental tool set. Remember when we talked about or, and in the two event case it wasn't so bad, but then you got to the three event case and it just became awful? We have to generalize with and too. We have to talk about and when there's more than two events. I know, I don't want to put that stress on you guys, you don't want that stress, but we just got to know. You guys want to do it? <laughs> I have fantastic news for you to start. Sometimes you have many events and you're allowed to make the assumption that they're all independent of one another. And if you have many events and you're told they're all independent, the probability of E1 and E2 and E3 and ER is as simple as just multiplying those probabilities together. You know, probability of E1 times probability of E2 times probability of E3 times probability of ER. A great example of this is coins. We often assume that the outcome of each coin is independent of any other flip. So even if you have 100 coins and you want to know the probability of the and of particular set of outcomes, you can just multiply those probabilities. Because we assume all coins, even if there's more than two of them, are independent. This is similar to mutual exclusivity. If you're doing or and many of your events are mutually exclusive, it's just a big old sum. The problem wasn't when our special uh, property was satisfied, it's when it's not. We need to know how you do probability of and when this special case of independence isn't satisfied. Oh, I do have an example though. <laughs> um, so we can talk about whether or not we figure out if more than two events satisfy independent. You guys ready for this? This is a little bit more work for you guys to really get your head around this important concept of independence now with three sets. I have two events. E is that dice one is a one. F is that dice 2 is equal to a 6, and my third event, G, is that the sum is 7. If you want to claim that more than two events are independent, you'd have to show that every combination of subsets of the events are also independent. So let's try it. Are these three events independent? Okay, first of all, are E and G independent? Oh, you know they are. You know, one, oh, do, 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 do. this is maybe surprising. What's the probability of E that you get a 1 on this dice? 1, 6. We learned this earlier. The probability that the sum of two dice is 7 is also 1 over 6 because there's, there's 6 outcomes. You get a 1 and a 6, uh, uh, a 2 and a 5, a 3 and a 4, a 4 and a 3, a uh, 5 and a 2, and a 6 and a 1. There's 6 out of 36 outcomes uh, where G is satisfied. So the probability that the sum of two dice is 7 is also 1 over 6. What's the probability that the first dice is a 1 and that the sum is uh, 7. The probability of the first dice is 1 and the sum is 7 is 1 over 36 because there's just one outcome where the first dice is 1. If I tell you the first dice is a 1, 
there's just one remaining assignment to the second dice so that the sum is equal to 7. There's just one outcome out of 36. And 1 over 6 times 1 over 6 equals 1 over 36. E and G are, in fact, independent. Now, are E and F independent? Yes, you know, we just think of the two dice rolls as being independent of each other. There's a 1 6 chance of getting a 1, there's a 1 6 chance of getting a 6, and there's 1 over 36 chance of getting exactly 1 over 6. Or, sorry, a 1 and a 6. So check E and F are independent. Check E and G are independent. Are F and G independent? So if I tell you F that your second dice is a 6, is it independent from knowing the sum is 7? What's the chance second dice is 6? 1 6. What's the chance that the two dice add up to 7? 1 6. What's the chance that both of these happen? OK, well, this one has to be a 6. And for the two dice to be adding up to 7, there's only one choice for this other dice. So there's one out of 36 outcomes where both F and G are true. And this times this equals this. We are on a roll. But finally, if you want to really claim that E and F and G are independent, you also have to show that the probability of E and F and G is equal to the probability of E times probability of F times probability of G. What's the chance that you roll a 1, so this event is true, you roll a 6, so this event is true, and that G event that the sum is 7 is true? There's just this one outcome. So there's a 1 over 36 chance of all three being true simultaneously. And that is not equal to 1 6 times 1 6 times 1 6. Long story short here, if you're told that many events are independent, that's a stronger claim. Because they've told you that any subset of those events are also independent. If you would like to prove that multiple events are independent, then you'd have to prove that for every single subset, their independence holds. Which is a little bit insane. Uh, but as I said, independence is something so powerful that we see it in the world, but also we assume it pretty often. Okay, we've got ourselves a new ability. Yeah, question. I have a question about the intuition behind this one. In the last question, when we rolled a one, it did affect the, the probability that you got a seven, but in this case, it didn't. Ah. Uh, why does that happen? Here, for E and F and G, so all of these pairwise looked independent. It's just when you thought about all three of them together that it didn't. And think about it this way. If I tell you that E is true, and I tell you that F is true, does it change your belief that G is true? So E, I tell you what's on the first dice. F, I tell you what's on the second dice. Does it change your belief about what's the sum of the two dice? Absolutely. So that's why the triplet intuitively is breaking down. Because telling you about the outcome of two events is certainly influencing the third. And when we actually looked at pairs of events, you know, being told the outcome of one wasn't changing our belief uh, in the other. But it was just when we looked at all three that independence fell apart. Wildness. OK, independence is a strong claim. Just to clarify the proof that we do in the very end, uh, why is it that our test is always the probability of all of them happening versus probability of each single one happening, and why do we multiply them together? Uh, that's just the independence claim. The independence claim means must be the case that each event multiplied to itself gives you the probability of and. Okay. And we're testing if that's true. Okay. And so it's a test. It's not, it, it would have been true if they were independent. Since they're not independent, it is not true. It is sufficient to show that these are not equal to show they're not independent. And it's sufficient to show they are equal to show that it is independent. Question. If G sums to a different number besides 7, could that potentially change the independence? My whole example would break down. 7 was the magical example that makes this whole thing work. Uh, we're going to talk about that a lot more in depth later, uh, but that's a little bit for later. I will give you one hint. Why is the sum of 7 so magical? It's because for any outcome on the first dice, there's exactly one outcome on the second dice that will lead to a 7. And now we're getting to the meta decision making for why I chose this example. But you know, there's a little bit of depth to the madness. But anyways, the, the point here isn't how I chose the example. It's just for this beautifully chosen example, we've got a lot of independence. OK, good questions. Learning goals for today. If you have events, if they're independent, probably if and becomes easy. If you have events, mutually exclusive makes or easy. Those are two different properties and you want to keep them separate. Uh, in mutually exclusive means there's no outcome in both events. Independent means one event doesn't change your belief in the other happening. Oh, 
I forgot to give you guys the generalized chain rule. If you can't show that multiple events are independent, here's how you do the probability of A and B and C. And we've talked about this lightly, but it's just worth putting out there. So what's the probability of A and B and C if they're not independent? You use chain rule, but you just keep going. That's the probability of A times the probability of B given A times the probability of C given A and B. If you had more than three events, you'd keep adding in another product, and the products would have these growing, growing conditional dependencies. Now, if they're independent, basically, you can drop all of that. And so if this property holds, it's just the products of the, uh, the events themselves. And if you can't show independence, you have to think about the conditionals. OK. It's time for some practice. Here's a practice that uses a little bit of genetics. It's a softer use of a genetics than the thing we started with at the beginning of class. Two parents have genes for whether or not their kids have curly hair. And we're going to assume that both parents have one dominant and one recessive gene. You don't need to know too much about um, probability here, but if you have these, sorry, you don't need to know too much about genetics. You need to know a lot about probability. If you have two parents with one dominant, one recessive, the child will only have curly hair if it both gets the recessive from the mother and from the father. If there's a 50% chance of getting it from the mother and a 50% chance of getting it from the father, assuming they're independent, the chance of any single child having this curly hair trait is 0 0.25. So I tell you that the gene you get from your mother is independent of the gene you get from your father. You only have curly hair if you happen to get recessive from each because they're independent. We can multiply the 0.5 chance of getting recessive from your father with the 0.5 from your mother. This all leads to just a piece of the setup of this problem. These, this couple is having kids and every kid has a 25% chance of having curly hair. There's three children What's the probability that all three children have curly hair? If you didn't know that each child was independent, and each child is independent, knowing one kid has curly hair, if you already know the genes of the parent, it doesn't change your belief that the next child has curly hair. It's like a next roll of the dice or a next coin flip. If you didn't know independence, you would have to use this generalized chain rule, which would have been annoying. You'd have to think, what's the chance the third kid has curly hair given that the first kid has curly hair and the second kid has curly hair, you'd probably have to use some nasty Bayes theorem. Since I tell you that each kid is independent, this is going to reduce to multiplication. Yes? Um, so about the expansion of the chain rule, does the order matter for the conditional probability? You, no, that's the one thing on your, on your, in your favor, is you ask, does the order matter? And it turns out, no. You could do E3, E2 given E3, and E1 given E2 and E3, uh, but you'll still have a lot of similar complexity. Does it cancel it out the base um, It's just, you know, if you think about it, at the end of the day, it will give you an expression for all three of them happening. You know, this is E1 and E2 in the world that E1 happened. This is E3 in the world where E1 and E2. And if you put all those three things together, you get E1, E2, and E3 happening. And all those constructions lead to a world where E1, E2, E3 happen. So fantastic. This is a lot of complexity just to lead to a relatively simple answer. If there's a 25% chance of one kid being curly haired, the chance of all three of them, kid one and kid two and kid three, is just going to be straight multiplication. So it'll be 0 0.25 to the power of three. And we can do that. Um, we can go uh, and do some Python. And we can do 0 0.25 to the power of three, which is the same as 0 0.25 times 0 0.25 times 0 0.25. Um, the chance of all three kids having curly hair is about 16%. Okay. Here's another example to show you how independence could be helpful. And this one's a little, it's just one step harder than that previous one. Now you guys know the internet connects computers like A and B. If you haven't, there's a YouTube video about that. That's not important right now. And that A and B are they're connected through a whole bunch of different routers. In this case, we're going to assume that they're connected through N different routers, but they could fail. And they could fail with different probabilities. Like this could be the path between my computer here and the Facebook server in Oregon. This one goes up the coast. This one goes up the mountains. You know, there's all these different paths. They have different probabilities of failing. And if any path is not failed, then there is a connection from A to B. 
The thing I'm interested in is what's the probability of a functional path for me to say the Facebook server? Uh, to be more abstract from computer A to computer B. This is a great example of a canonical independence question. You know, if I put this on the midterm, I'd really hope that everyone gets it right, though it is a little bit hard. Why don't you take a second and talk about this with the person next to you? Because this is a 10 out of 10 important independence example. OK. I want to set this problem up. And I want to set this problem up in a way that leads to a dead end. Because I want you to see the dead ends as well as the good ways to solve this. We want probability of E. I'm going to define a whole bunch of other events that are going to make my life easier. I'm going to define x1, that path 1 is functional. x2 means path 2 is functional. And x means that xn's path is functional. So you can imagine you have like all these xi's, where x1 is this is making it, x2 is this is making it. The question is, in fact, asking this. It's asking, is there a path x1, or is there a path x2, or is there a path xn? If any of these are true, then there is, in fact, a functioning path. Now, when I see a problem with or, the first thing I go is I look for mutual exclusivity. I don't have mutual exclusivity. I've been told independent, but maybe mutual exclusivity exists. For mutual exclusivity to exist, it must not be possible for two of these to be true at the same time. Is it possible for two of these to be true at the same time? Oh, yeah, absolutely. It's totally possible, and in fact, likely for two paths to be functional simultaneously. Therefore, it's possible for both x1 and x2 to be true. Can't use mutual exclusivity, doesn't it hold? So here's the really dark path to go down. <laughs> You're like, well, mutual exclusivity doesn't hold. Let's use inclusion exclusion. So it's like probably of x1 plus x2 plus x up to xn, then subtract off all the pairs, then add in all the triplets, then subtract off all the quadruplets. And of course, there's n of these. They haven't even told us how many there are. And like you just start sweating profusely. And you're like, why, Chris, do you make me do this? And in fact, I don't want you to do that. That's why I show you that there's other ways. Did find, somebody find another path to happiness that didn't include going down that inclusion exclusion? Yeah. So we're looking at an at least one scenario. So instead, you can calculate the probability that none of them are functioning, and then just subtract that from one. OK, one minus the probability that none are functioning. I like how you said we're looking at an at least one scenario, because that's really a good clue that you want to do this one minus trick. Because at least one is annoying, but you know, maybe it's just, it's always true to be equal to one minus the probability of none of them work. And you know what? This probability that none of them work, I can express that in terms of ands. You know, it's the probability of x1 complement and x2 complement, you know, and up to xn complement. Because it's the probability that none of them are functioning is saying that, you know, this one's not functioning and this one's not functioning. And this one's not functioning. They've all broken. <laughs> and the reason this is so beautiful is because now I've got an and problem. What does and care about? It cares about independence. Do we have independence? Absolutely. The problem told us to assume that the routers were independent. You're like, it told us the routers functions are independent. Are the routers failing independent? Yeah, we proved that earlier in class. You know, if x1 is independent of x2, then x1 complement is also independent of x2 complement. So we have ourselves a situation where all of these are anded, and we know they're independent. That, therefore, this whole term just becomes a whole big product. So it's going to be equal to 1 minus the product over i of probability of x i complement. We're not given the probability of x i complement. We're given the probability of x i. So p i is the probability of it functioning. Xi complement is just going to be 1 minus that. So it's going to be you know, 1 minus the probability of the first router failing times 1 minus the probability of the second router failing times 1 minus right, of succeeding. Oh, geez. P, P, <laughs> Pi is the probability that it's functioning. So 1 minus the probability of the first one functioning times 1 minus the probability of the second one functioning times 1 minus the probability of the third one functioning. And each of these is going to be, you know, 1 minus pi. pi is the probability of the ith one functioning. 
that all leads to the probability of all of them failing, and it's one minus the probability of all of them failing. The and allowed us to think about each one on its own and just multiply those things together. This was a dead end. Questions about this? Yeah. <laughs> this one? Yeah, this is just, you know, if I didn't write this notation, it would look like this. Probability of xi complement times probability of x2 complement times probability of x3 complement. You know, a shorthand notation of all this multiplication. You know how this is like the big old sum, shorthand for lots of sum? This is the shorthand for lots of multiplications. So it says for loop i times. And every time, multiply this term. So probability of x i complement. And this is like the index in your for loop. So this is like a for loop multiplication. This is a for loop addition. OK. This is all in your notes in case you wanted to check it out in a slower pace than we went over it now. The most important example that I can think of is this one. It's going to seem a little bit abstract, but because it's so important, I actually spent a lot of time and I put together a full interactive demo in the course reader. If there is one thing to really, really focus on to make sure you're getting all these concepts together, it's this idea of many coin flips. And I have a central question for you. My central question for you is, imagine a world where I flip 10 coins. What's the probability of getting exactly some number of heads? So maybe exactly six heads if I flip 10 coins. That might not seem like such a deep question, but I promise you that if you think about this question and if you understand it deeply, it's going to illuminate so much of the next section of CS109. Now, I'm going to do a weird thing with my coins. I'm going to allow my coins to be heads with a different probability than 0.5. So this is a normal coin. It's got a probability of being heads of 0.5 if I flip 10 of them. You know, you could get an outcome like tails, heads, heads, tails, 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 heads, heads, heads. And you know, like if you feel like doing this a whole bunch without actually getting out coins, you can hit a whole bunch. Oh my god, that's so much fun. Computers are incredible. I'm going to do something a little bit funny. I'm going to allow us to have these weird coins that have probabilities of not 0.5. The reason this example is so important is not because we care about coins. It's because coins are a metaphor for so many processes in the world. And not all those processes are going to have a 0.5 probability of heads. And to allow for this metaphor to be so powerful, I'm going to be thinking about coins that can come up heads with different probabilities. So if I make this a 90% chance of being heads, notice how many more are heads. Often all of them. Um, and I'm going to, just for now, think about a 60% chance. So the core question is, you flip a coin 10 times, what's the chance of exactly six heads? We're going to get there. In order to get there, we're going to think through a series of problems that are going to build up complexity of thinking about mutual exclusivity and independence together. OK, here's my first warm up for you guys. If I flip 10 coins, each coin has a 60% chance of being heads. I hope you guys can see this. What's the chance of getting heads, heads, heads 10 times in a row? Are coins independent? Absolutely. The outcome of one coin doesn't change the outcome of another coin. Your belief doesn't get updated. As such, since they're independent, what's the chance of exactly this outcome? OK, I heard two different things. I heard 1 half to the power of 10, and I heard 0.6 to the power of 10. Uh, why don't you guys just yell out loud which one you like more? 0.6. Yeah, OK. 0.6 is the probability of the first one being heads. You have to multiply by 0.6 is probably the second one being head. Multiply by 0.6 itself 10 times is 0.6 to the power of 10. In this case, um, you know, it's going to p, p to the power of n. Um, then you could plug this in and get a number. How about this? What's your chance of getting this? Tail, 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 10 times. Are they still independent even though they're not heads? Yeah. yeah this is the complement. The complement's still independent. OK. So 0.4 is the probability of the first coin being a tails. 1 minus 0.6. And we're going to multiply by the chance of the second coin being a tails. That's 0.4. We're going to multiply that by the chance of the third coin being a tails. That's 0.4. You multiply by 0.4 by itself 10 times. OK, great. You guys ready to bump this up a notch? 
Heads, I know I'm doing this slowly, but it's just that important. Four heads and then six tails. What's the chance of that one? Talk about it with the person next to you for a second. We're getting to that level of complexity. In this case, order does matter. I say the first four are exactly heads and the, the next six are tails. OK. If you got this answer, great. If you didn't get the answer I'm about to write, think about where your misconception is and then see if you can ask a clarifying question. So I'm assuming that order matters. This is the first heads. The probability of getting the first coin as a head is going to be 0 0.6. It's independent of the next coin, so the probability of the next coin, of coin number two being a head, is going to be 0 0.6. Now, I'm multiplying 0 0.6 by itself a whole bunch of times, so I don't want to do that. I'm going to use a power instead. How many times do I multiply 0 0.6? Yeah, because there's four heads. Now I've talked about the probability of these four events simultaneously occurring. So all of them occurring. It's not like they have to, well, all events occurred. They didn't have to happen the exact same moment in time, but they all occurred um, after this one run of the experiment. I haven't talked about the outcome of the next six coins. They're all tails. And the probability of the first tails is 0 0.4. It's independent of the second tails, so I'd also multiply by another 0 0.4. I don't want to write multiplying this thing by itself six times, because that would be tedious. So instead, I'm going to use powers. You might have just put 0 0.4 in here. I prefer to do 1 minus 0 0.6. That way, you don't have to worry about where this magical 0 0.4 comes from. It's just 0 0.6 was my probability of a heads. So probably if heads is 0.6, probably the tails is 1 minus 0.6. I slightly prefer that. You guys buying this so far? Here's where it gets tricky. I now want to know the probability of exactly k heads. So I want to know the probability, let's say k equals 4. I want to know the probability that if you flip 10 coins that you get exactly 4. Why is that a different problem than this one? This, I want exactly k heads. That seems like what we calculated before. Can someone tell me one reason that these two are different? Yes, an idea. Because the heads could be like at any point in the 10 for the k heads, but for the first example, it had to be the first four. Yes. What we calculated here was like first four heads and then six tails exactly like that. But to be exactly k heads, your heads could have occurred anywhere. It could be the last four coins. You could have had them, you know, interspersed differently throughout. Here's one example of heads, or four heads out of ten. Can I give you another one? Tails, heads, tails, heads, tails, heads. Wait, I've got three so far, right? Tails, heads. Now I've got four. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So here I have another example. We now have two different examples of orderings where there's exactly four heads. Are there others? Mm -hmm. How many? You're like, oh my god, do I know how to do that counting? Before you think about doing that counting, can I just show you all of them? Computers are so beautiful. There's a lot of them. These are all the different ways of getting exactly four heads, all the different outcomes. So then my question is, how many are there? And I did see a hand go up for an idea. How many are there? 10 choose four. 10 choose four. How did you get there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We want to choose out of the 10 places four slots to turn into heads, choose to be heads. Okay. And then the rest aren't in our set of heads. You are not wrong. You were in fact right, sorry, that, that's so cheeky. You got it right. But there was a different way of thinking about this that leads to the exact same answer. Yes? It's like if you have 10 letters, it's like Mississippi, like how do we arrange? It's Mississippi, but instead of like a beautiful river, you've got this really crappy word that's got six T's and four H's. <laughs> and it's how many ways can you do permutations with these indistinct objects? Permutations where these six T's look indistinct and these four H's look indistinct. If it was permutations with indistinct objects, you get n factorial divided by how many you know, are heads, that's K, 
factorial, times how many are tails, that's n minus k, and that's factorial. And that is equivalent to n choose k. Two conceptual ways of thinking about how to count this, but both of them lead to there's n choose k different outcomes. I have bad news for you guys. The probability of exactly k heads is going to be a big old or. It's the probability of this outcome or this outcome or this outcome. We're going to do after or, but not of two outcomes or two events, but rather n choose k different events. Mind-blowingly awful. But somebody's like, it's not awful, Chris. Hold faith. Why might this not be awful? Yes? Sorry, one more time. Because they will evaluate to the same thing. They will evaluate to the same thing. So actually, when you do multiplication, each one has the same probability. But there's another reason this is not awful. Yes? So are independent of one another? They're not independent. Close, though. They're mutually exclusive. So probability of or gets easy when they're mutually exclusive. Independence says that knowing one of these is the outcome doesn't change your belief in the others. But if you tell me this is the outcome, I know this one didn't happen. They're mutually exclusive because it's not possible to get this exact arrangement and to also get this exact arrangement. So these two outcomes can't occur at the exact same time. They're mutually exclusive. Which means if you want the probability of the or of each of these, you can add up the probability of this one plus the probability of this one plus the probability of this one. It's just going to be a sum like this. Probability of exactly k heads is going to be a sum over every row in that, the probability of that particular row. Someone's already said it though. No matter which row you look at, if there are exactly four heads, the probability of that row will be the four heads, wherever you find them, will each be a p. The six tails will each be a 1 minus p. So no matter which row you look at, the probability of each row is p4 times 1 minus p to the power of 6. So if you sum up the probability of each row, and you plug in that each row has exactly this, and then you realize this is a sum that doesn't use the i's, you end up with there's n choose k rows. Every row has this probability. Since we're summing up that thing n choose k times, it will be n choose k times the probability of one row. Isn't that beautiful? It brings like all the concepts we learned into the exact same example. If there's one thing to study, learn this example forward, backward. It's so helpful for just understanding all your tools, but also taking this to the next level. Have a wonderful day. Come back on Friday. We'll continue this conversation.